Uh, my name is Lisa Chernyenka. I'm a PhD student at uh, Oxford Internet Institute at Social Media Science. Uh, and today I'm going uh, to speak about the ongoing project uh, or research in our group, the Humanization and Telegram, uh, and specifically focus on the roles of in-group perception in this phenomenon. Uh, and because this is uh, in-progress work, uh, your feedback is very, very welcome. I'm just trying to arrange everything. Yeah, stay here. Um, so, uh, here is the overview of the research. Let me start with the third line. I'm using the data in, uh, in the context of Russian invasion to Ukraine, because in this context, uh, we versus them, in-group versus out-group is quite, quite obvious. Uh, I'm looking at language used when discussed out-group online, focusing on dehumanization phenomenon. Specifically, uh, I'm using data from Telegram, specifically Telegram news and uh, political channels. Uh, to address research questions about uh, language representation of dehumanization and the role of in-group identity in this phenomenon. So when I speak dehumanization, I mean the act of treating or perceiving people as less than human. I'm going to discuss that in more details in uh, one of the next slides, but the reason I'm focusing on that is that because data shows that consequences of dehumanization in the context of military uh, conflicts uh, are very devastating. It's, uh, it contributes to support for war, outdoor violence, and even genocide. And therefore, I'm specifically focusing on blatant forms of uh, dehumanization um, directed towards our group defined in political or national terms. So as you might expect in, in uh, the context of words. Uh, quite uh, obvious. So just to give you the taste of data, and I must apologize, <laughs> dehumanizing language here. Uh, none of this uh, reflects uh, views of myself or anyone in my team. But uh, this illustrates what I mean by dehumanizing language in Telegram. On the left you see uh, a screenshot from Telegram where Ukrainians are dehumanized by being called Ukrafascists, and it says that they should be mixed with the ground. And on the right, uh, a Rus dead Russian soldier is dehumanized. He's compared to orc and to a uh, well done steak. I apologize again. But this is just to give you a taste of how bad it is and uh, what kind of data I'm using. While there exist tools for NLP, uh, NLP tools for dehumanization detecting, uh, detection in texts, these tools haven't been tested against ground truth so far. And also most, <laughs> so why, while there exists NLP tools already proposed for detection of dehumanization in language, first, they haven't been tested against ground truth, and second, most of them focus on aspects of out-group perception. Uh, which might not be enough, uh, of which I'm speaking a bit later. So what is dehumanization? I might, what, what, what constructs uh, contribute to it? And I might have provided you with a long and difficult um, definition, but to give you a more immediate taste, here is the picture. So uh, when the other is dehumanized, they are perceived as being less developed, being all the same, uh, having no agency, not feeling anything, having a, uh, not able to decide for themselves, uh, not caring of each other, and in general being unwanted and disgusting. So more formally, the constructs are vertical comparison, deindividuation, denial of agency, and communality, indifference, and humiliation. As you can see, these aspects actually are about our group perception, what we think about who they are. However, theory suggests one more aspect. The humanized other is perceived as to being uh, very different from ourselves, from the in-group. Um, so this is an, uh, speaks for psychological distancing phenomenon. And as you can see in this picture, <laughs> it actually illustrates this idea. It might be about what we want to say about ourselves when we dehumanize others. And if this is so, then we should also take into account what we think about in-group and measuring out-group. So what I've done, uh, I've collected data from Telegram. Uh, not of this already been done, but what's in progress? Uh, after collecting data and filtering out only those posts that discuss in-group and out-group, uh, I measure a, ad, a set of variables measuring these aspects that I described, like vertical comparison and agency. And by comparing dehumanizing versus neutral posts, uh, I create a contrasted data set. Uh, I want to see first which tools, which 
phenomenon most contributes to dehumanization? And second, which of them better explain difference? Those which describe out-group perception aspects or in-group, out-group perception disparity, as I've been uh, describing. So these are the two research questions I'm addressing too. Um, the data. So uh, I've taken 100 telegram channels in Russia and 100 in Ukraine. Most popular telegram channels uh, on political topics and news in general over three months. Uh, one month before the full scale invasion, which is 24th of February, two months after uh, February 22, I mean. Um, then using dictionary, I, I uh, filtered out posts that do not um, discuss out groups, of, uh, in group and out, uh, and out group. And then uh, using API, I prompt, uh, I prompt LLM model, actually GPT 3.5 is one of the several, and uh, G prompt it to classify posts as dehumanizing versus neutral. What's important? I'm not developing a classification tool in any way. I just want a contrasted data set. So I run this classification three times and only add to my final sample for analysis those that is systematically classified as dehumanizing or systematically as not dehumanizing. So those in between I just skip because that's not relevant, not particularly useful to my analysis. Um, that's what I do. So the uh, one more model that I, uh, I, I'm going to uh, use, I'm, I'm actually using it, that's in progress for prompting is Lama 2. But here is the framework of the main things being done in the paper. So um, there are four ma main phenomena, measure, main constructs measured there. Equal treatment, individual perception, agents, and communality described above. So F is the general notation for all of them. So this is done for every of these variables. And basically, I am testing for the presence of three biases in the data when discriminating between the and neutral. Um, so yeah, out group inferiority bias actually um, is present when dehumanizing posts show lower scores in out group perception than neutral posts. In group superiority bias uh, is when in group perception is better than out group perception in dehumanizing posts. And what I call amplified in group superiority bias is when the difference between in group and out group is more pronounced in dehumanizing than in neutral. So when the last of these two are present, this speaks for the role of in group perception for the phenomenon of dehumanization. Additionally, I'm testing whether effective polarization is relevant to dehumanization. I don't have time to cover that, but just to let you know. So what specifically is done to the data, how I measure these constructs? Um, again, I won't be able to go into all details. Uh, some of these measures are lexicon-based, some rather embeddings-based. But uh, again, to illustrate how this works, how I measure that in text, uh, let's discuss the probably most complex um, construct, agency. Whether one is able to think, to feel, to decide for themselves. Uh, there is a connotation frames a method in NLP, in NLP which automatically extract subject, verb, object tuples. So, uh, for example, we punish them, subject, verb, object. It automatically extracts all of them, and by analyzing semantic content, semantic content of verb, it measures agency assigned to subject and to object. For example, in this example, we punish them, assigns more agency to we than to them. So we can, uh, and there is a dictionary uh, for, for the verbs. So basically, for both for in-group and out-group, in Ukrainian and Russian posts, I can calculate average agency overall uh, overall post, basically, for demonizing the neutral. This is approximately how it works. Let me know if you have questions. Uh, I can come back to that if that's relevant. This is about data, so 100 telegram channels in Russia, in Ukraine, number of posts you can see. You can see that in Ukraine, actually, there, there, were, there were more posted in Ukraine than in Russia, especially after invasion, because people have to be had to be updated uh, so frequently. N all Russian posts are in Russian, Ukrainian are mostly in Ukrainian language, but also 41 are in Russian, 41 channels posts in Russian. Um, so this is yet to be done. <laughs> what, uh, but to get a sense of um, whether my idea is promising or not in my data, uh, I did the following. To identify uh, whether in-group is relevant here or uh, in-group perception or an identity is relevant here or not, I simply counted uh, the 
frequency of using we, different forms of we as the general in-group identifier in all posts. Uh, and then uh, analyzed whether it is the same percentage of posts which use we. Uh, is, is it the same uh, among posts discussing our group and not discussing our group, among posts dehumanizing our group and not dehumanizing our group? Uh, so this is very descriptive, uh, very preliminary, but still, it turned out that post invasion, indeed, both Russian and Ukrainian uh, channels use we more frequently when discussing out group than when not discussing out group. But what's important, uh, and that's highlighted in orange, this hadn't been the case in Ukraine before the invasion. So Ukrainians did not, I can interpret it like, uh, Ukrainians did not associate their in-group identity uh, with discussing out group and, you know, like opposing out group before the invasion. But they have started doing that after the invasion. In Russia, this difference was observed before and after. And similarly for dehumanizing versus neutral. Again, post-invasion in both countries, we is, more fr we is used more frequently in dehumanizing posts than in non-dehumanizing posts. But it hasn't been the case in Ukraine before the invasion. It was the case in Russia before the invasion. So this um, basically gives some promise that I'm probably looking in the right direction, um, yet to be validated with specific variables that I'm actually adopting to my um, research at the moment, but preliminary results are like so. Uh, Out-group dehumanization may be related to in-group unity, uh, sense of in-group unity and strength of in-group unity. Uh, and basically, if this is so, this suggests new approach for mitigating dehumanization. Because we, it's not, it might not be enough to just say, oh, they are not that bad, and target all, all our interventions into speaking of who they are, and maybe they're not that bad, and like humans. But also to turn attention to what we think about ourselves. What is the incentive behind our desire to dehumanize? And also this mechanism might be different for aggressor and defender, which also should be taken into account. Um, this um, potential strategic approach of Russia, strategic dehumanization in Russian Telegram, uh, also um, this hypothesis has also been pro uh, proven legitimate in uh, not only in my research, uh, but also in the research of my colleagues. Basically, uh, this is Russian telegram, use of dehumanizing language in Russian telegram. And you can see the peak, and this peak is before the invasion. Seven months before the invasion, there was a big increase in use of dehumanizing language towards the Ukrainians. So this speaks to uh, the hypothesis of strategic dehumanization from that side. And also in my data, I see that posts, uh, sorry, channels that are more Mm, likely to dehumanize Ukrainians in Russia uh, are more associated with the state. So it comes from uh, up to, bot uh, to bottom. But it's, um, it's opposite in Ukraine. So those uh, uh, channels that are more likely to dehumanize in Ukraine are more coming from general public. And also they started reacting after the invasion. So that speaks for more reactive nature of this phenomenon in Ukraine. And maybe, maybe these dehumanization source protective purposes. No excuse for that, but <laughs> different nature of the phenomenon. Why this is at all relevant? Basically, this is just a um, screenshot from the picture from uh, another research also done in uh, the context of this war. And it shows that uh, simple intervention showing a small vid YouTube video rehumanizing uh, Russian soldier, if I'm not mistaken. And this watching this simple video actually reduced the desire to uh, aggressive intentions towards Russians in general. Uh, this, this was done in, uh, for U.S. population. And uh, to, to, uh, to, to finish with that, rehumanization, uh, the phenomenon of rehumanization, should be from dehumanizing to normal perception to acknowledgement of human nature in the other, is the focus of my PhD thesis in general. So I'll also analyze the role of in-group perception in this phenomenon. This is just an illustration of what rehumanizing publication looks like, and I will analyze what's more effective. To include, I'm also part of the Ukraine case study project. Uh, we focus on the consequences of Russian war in Ukraine for information, communication, and cybersecurity. Just to let you know, if you are interested, please, uh, happy, I'm happy to discuss. We organized, uh, so this is basically PhD symposium for this topic that <laughs> we organized earlier. This is my team uh, for uh, Ukraine case studies. Thank you so much for your attention.